the OS, uh, which is the presentation by the EU Commissioner for Crisis Management, Ambassador Janis Lenarcic. And this also will be followed by questions and answers. Of course, many of us know Ambassador Lenarcic. Uh, we worked together for many years. So um, I will uh, take no much time and just give you the floor, Ambassador Lenarcic. For you. Excellent. <clears throat> Well, dear President and dear Secretary General, distinguished uh, members of the Bureau, it's a great pleasure to uh, see so many familiar faces again. And I do have uh, fond memories of our, of our um, uh, cooperation several years ago. Now, let me just briefly at the beginning introduce my mandate because crisis management uh, sounds uh, very impressive. But in reality, what uh, I have under my responsibility is two things. One is humanitarian aid, and another one is the civil protection. And the objectives are, on the latter area, to ensure timely and effective coordination of response of the European Union to crisis either within or outside of Europe. And on the humanitarian uh, track, it is um, my the key objective is to ensure that the humanitarian aid by the EU, which is the biggest donor of the humanitarian aid in the world, is um, provided in accordance with the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence, and that the international humanitarian law is respected. So this, this is my mandate. And of course, you will understand that this crisis that is now facing not only Europe, but the entire world, is of such magnitude that here in Brussels, it's not just me, but it is essentially the entire European Commission led by President von der Leyen that is involved in response to this crisis. I will not uh, dwell on our internal European Union response uh, because uh, I think that the OSC is more interested in our external aspects. But let me just say that the European Commission was um, uh, has already uh, very early in the crisis uh, decided to activate its crisis uh, mechanisms. Already in January, uh, we activated um, our early warning uh, for our, uh, in our health area, and we also activated our internal coordination mechanism. What we were doing was essentially the following. In addition to uh, work on the repatriation of European Union citizens and other uh, areas, we worked on four scenarios of how this crisis may develop. And we called on the European Union member states to be prepared, to be prepared and to uh, work uh, in coordinated manner and to display solidarity. Later on, when the European Union was, uh, became itself an epicenter of the outbreak, all these principles of preparedness, solidarity, and, and uh, coordination were tested. But lately, this, uh, the work of the European Union has, has improved on all three counts, I can say. Uh, there is now um, functioning solidarity, and there is now a functioning coordinated approach. But as I said, I will now focus more on, on, on the external aspects, uh, especially with a view to other OSC participating states, not only uh, EU member states. Because uh, as, as it is uh, clear now, uh, the pandemic uh, is exacerbating already complex and uh, challenging context in many parts of the world. The multiple crises, the uh, humanitarian needs, it, everything is getting worse because of this pandemic. And by now, pandemic has reached all countries of the world. And uh, its consequences, that is already clear by now, will be profound. Uh, what is our uh, key concern is that the impact, the impact of this pandemic will be particularly harsh on those countries and populations that are already uh, fragile and most vulnerable. And in this context, we particularly have in mind the humanitarian settings, um, where uh, we have uh, conflict affected populations, we have refugees, we have migrants and internally displaced persons and other marginalized groups. These are most vulnerable to the impact that this pandemic is already having. So this is an issue that we are trying to address with our partners. 
in various multilateral fora. We, as I said, are particularly concerned with the impact of this pandemic on the situation in the conflict zone, uh, also in our vicinity, also in the uh, areas that are of particular attention to OSC, for instance, Eastern Ukraine, or the uh, huge number of uh, <clears throat> refugees hosted by uh, Turkey and some other countries in the Middle East, and also in the Western Balkans. Uh, our support to, for instance, uh, conflict affecting population in Ukraine is well known, and we have just recently announced additional assistance in the amount of 13 million euro in humanitarian assistance for Eastern Ukraine, including, including uh, support to the, uh, to the uh, pandemic related uh, efforts. What we believe is that uh, we need to tackle this pandemic in an integrated way. Uh, we need to, put, to pull together humanitarian development and stabilization and peace building projects. All of this has, has to be made COVID relevant, has to be adjusted so as to enable us to tackle this challenge effectively. We have tried in the European Union to do so by forming a so-called Team Europe approach, meaning that we pull together all EU member states, all European Union institutions, including the financial institutions like European Investment Bank, plus European member states. And we have been uh, able so far to pool 20 billion, more than 20 billion euro designed to assist other countries, other countries, third countries in fighting the pandemic. Also, we have mobilized our union civil protection mechanism. We have, for instance, through this mechanism since January, when we started with repatriation from Wuhan in China, to this day, we have repatriated through this mechanism almost 60,000 European citizens and also many citizens of other OSC participating states. So not just European Union member states, but also other uh, citizens of other participating states of the OSC. We are also trying to address the problem of, uh, of uh, international transport, including air transport, because now that the borders are largely closed, the air traffic has been uh, stopped to a large degree, we now have a problem, a very particular problem, in making sure that the humanitarian assistance reaches the countries and populations where it is needed because uh, there is a difficulty in getting air cargo uh, transport, transported and also the humanitarian workers and medical workers. So we are setting up now the European Union Humanitarian Air Bridge, which is designed to, to overcome this challenge. In more general terms, uh, to date, uh, under our civil protection mechanism, more than 36 countries have requested medical assistance. For, the system works uh, in the following way. Any country of the world can ask for the assistance and the response is then given by EU member states. This has, system has shown its limitations at the point when there was a severe shortage of personal protective equipment and some other equipment in the European Union. Uh, you all must know of the case when the Italian request, for instance, did not uh, get response for uh, several, for, for some time. This has now improved. Now there is a, this system is working again, uh, not yet to the extent necessary, but much better than it was in the beginning. Uh, now the uh, assistance is going to Italy and some other places, uh, but more will have to be done because uh, <clears throat> we have now 36 requests and so far we've been able to respond to 11 of them. It's difficult uh, situation when you have increased demand, dramatically increased demand for items like personal protective equipment and other medical equipment, while the supply is not able to catch up. In addition, uh, European Union is already working on, on recovery and uh, of course we will not uh, leave out of our minds uh, also the needs um, outside Europe. We will work with, uh, with our partners from the neighborhood from the Western Balkans and elsewhere. Uh, we will have that in mind. 
and uh, we will uh, we will uh, try to for the, to play the role that the European Union has uh, uh, it's uh, an ambition to play, and that is to be a geopolitical ambition also in the in the uh, effort global global effort to to face the pandemic. I would conclude with the following uh, because I want to be short so as to have some interaction with the members of the assembly. Now, uh, as I said, the solidarity was tested during uh, this crisis at the European level and globally. But I think that it has also become clear to everyone by now that we can only face this challenge successfully if we show solidarity, if we help to help each other. And this has to happen at the global level, not only regional, but global level. That's where I, he, I see a uh, particularly important uh, role of, of parliaments and parliamentarians and especially of supranational parliamentary bodies like OEC Parliamentary Assembly uh, in particular. So I would invite you to, to consider uh, being especially attentive and active in two areas. First, in your strong support to multilateral approach to address the pandemic, because no country of this world can face this challenge alone with success. Either we will suppress the pandemic globally, or it will bounce back and haunt us everywhere. So I see very important role for parliamentary assembly in promoting the, the multilateral approach uh, to, to, uh, <clears throat> to pandemic. And second, second uh, role that I, that I feel uh, is, is uh, at least as important is the role of the parliaments and parliamentary assembly in emphasizing the need to respect what are fundamental values, which European Union and OSCE share to a large degree. degree. We, we call them fundamental values in the European Union, in OSC, you have a number of commitments, OSC commitments, that relate to the values of democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Why is this important? It's important because governments all over the world, in order to tackle the uh, pandemic, have introduced numerous harsh restrictions on these fundamental rights. Uh, there are restrictions with regard to the freedom of movement. There are restrictions with regard to the public gatherings. There are restrictions uh, to the freedom of religion and belief in the sense that many, in many countries, places of worship are closed and so on and so on. What I think is important, and I would really encourage you to voice it clearly and continuously, is that these kind of emergency measures that restrict fundamental values are only acceptable to the extent that they are proportionate, meaning that they are only in place to the extent which is strictly necessary and no more. And second, that such all such restrictive measures are uh, limited in time and removed immediately when they are no longer needed. So this is my, my, um, my encouragement to, to members of the uh, OSC Parliamentary Assembly, uh, because I see uh, here a good synergy between the European Union and its values and the OSC commitments. Uh, there is a lot of common ground, and uh, I would, um, I would uh, urge um, that we join forces in preservation, in preservation, even in a, or especially in a crisis like the one that we are now, uh, <clears throat> we are now facing of the values that we share. So much for the beginning from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Commissioner Lenarcic. Uh, your intervention is uh, stricken a lot of interest. You have uh, seven questions. But before moving to the questions, I just want to say that what you've just said about uh, these two main pillars, multilateral approach and respect for fundamental values or OSC commitments, as we call them, this is exactly the two pillars on which we have based our action, you will see from statements that we've already made and from uh, activities that we'll take in the future. This is exactly, we work very strongly to strengthen the multilateral factors, 
uh, in a very cooperative fashion with other international organizations. Here there is no rivalries or they're not trying to, to perform better than others. We want all multilateral bodies to perform well and to be effective. And of course, uh, we are focusing very much on the respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Uh, Mr. President, you wanted to say something before I go to the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, please, Mr. President. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Roberto. Um, and then, of course, uh, dear Commissioner, dear, uh, dear uh, Janusz, uh, uh, it's a, I'd like to say that it's a, it's a pleasure to see you, of course, in this capacity. But uh, as you said, it's, it's, uh, we understand that it's a very challenging position at this moment. I would say one of the key positions maybe in this current situation. And it somehow it uh, became like a tradition that OSC-related people, personalities are in charge of crisis management. Previously, it was also one of the active members of uh, our assembly. As, uh, as I remember, Christos uh, Stylianidis, who was in a position of uh, European commissioner. And uh, it's very good that uh, the people who are in charge now uh, in the European Commission very well understand uh, real value of multilateralism and understand well, of course, what OSC, uh, what this organization is OSC. So we planned a very good visit to Brussels before this pandemic, also planning to meet you along with other commissioners. And also, of course, uh, <clears throat> there would be a very interesting discussion there. But now uh, we see that, uh, of course, our joint efforts are important. We're trying to be you know, uh, as you said, uh, uh, active, and you see uh, active, and Roberto already outlined your activities. Uh, but from your point of view, I think to prioritize all those two main uh, directions, of course, it's in line with ours too. Uh, but as you said, uh, also representing a specific region, uh, just speaking from Georgia, you said that uh, European Union is the biggest donor, and we understand what a scale of demand is now. And every country is uh, big or small with a good economy or less of everybody is suffering now. And everybody has a shortage of financial means, uh, equipment and all this stuff. And EU is seen as a, one of the major source of this aid. Um, so, and then you are in, in charge of that at this moment as a, as a head of crisis management direction. Um, how you see, you know, uh, help and assistance and, and the cooperation with uh, non-EU members, you mentioned about this, but maybe in a little bit in more details, if you can describe uh, uh, the countries who are in the Eastern Partnership, especially those countries who, who have uh, uh, territorial problems, and again, of course, the judge, uh, and then they inform you what happening in my own country in Abkhazia or in Ossetia, where unfortunately, even in a, in a times of this difficult moment of pandemic, uh, the de facto uh, authorities or regimes can use that to discriminate people more or to have a severe, uh, let's say, rules on the ground and, and a lot of human rights restrictions and a fundamental rights, as you mentioned. Uh, so it's interesting what what the point of view of European Union at this moment, how you could focus on assistance of those uh, regions about Ukraine. You already uh, yeah, spoke, so that would be uh, that would be my my question, and I'd like to wish you again uh, success and and uh, good luck in your important work. Thank you, Mr. President. I've also been joined by Senator Cardin, who I am aware has to leave for another meeting. So I'll give first the floor to Senator Cardin, and then we'll move on to all those who have requested. Great. Great. Senator Cardin, you have the floor. Welcome. Good morning. Well, thank you. I really wanted uh, to comment on Mr. Mullard's uh, comments, because I think he's right on target. And what he was saying very much fits into the mission of the Special Representative for anti-Semitism, Racism, and Intolerance. The point is, is pretty important that as we go through this pandemic and we see action taken by government, that it needs to be wrapped within the principles of the OSCE. And it really concerns me that there isn't a real champion for speaking out for the human rights issues right now because everyone is so concerned about the pandemic. 
And I recognize that the United States Senate, you know, Senator Wicker's on this call, uh, Congressman Hudson's on the call in the House. We've appropriated three trillion dollars to deal with what we call Marshall Plan and health care to, to deal with uh, dealing with our our vulnerable people, whether it's housing or uh, dealing with our health care workers or or dealing with the frontline people or dealing with people that have mental health challenges as a result of this pandemic and to get our economy back on track. But I do think it's critically important, the message that we just heard, that as parliamentarians, we need to speak out that our actions in dealing with this pandemic must be uh, necessary, it must be proportional, it must be transparent, and it must be temporary. And I think these points are areas that I would hope we would all agree upon. Uh, and, and the message which we just heard, I think, is critically important that we as parliamentarians have a critical role to play. That's the point I really wanted to make. Uh, as your special representative, yes, we saw prior to COVID-19 uh, a rise of deadly intolerance uh, in the United States and throughout the entire region. The free life synagogue and what happened in El Paso and throughout the OSCE, it was dangerous before COVID-19. Now it's even more dangerous to vulnerable people. And we all need to really pull together and speak out on behalf of our principles. Uh, I'll give a full report later on this year but I really wanted to underscore the point we just heard. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Cardin. And uh, I now give the floor to Vice President uh, Christian Vieri. Christian, you have the floor. Christian, we don't hear you. Uh, we see you're unmuted, but uh, we don't hear your voice. Microphone seems to be okay, but the voice doesn't come. The audio. You want to try and I give? Yeah. Yes. Correct. Now it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Montella, dear colleagues, uh, Commissioner. Time is precious, so I'll be very brief. First of all, thank you for your time and for your message to us. Um, I'll make one comment first. Uh, it's true that the European Union was not uh, quick enough. This situation, uh, <clears throat> we are all unprepared for this situation and we couldn't see the upcoming disaster. But now it seems to me that it's uh, back uh, on its, uh, in its, and the coordination that is being done is really very helpful. And that uh, you're improving your response to this pandemic and um, Efforts are very important to make sure that we all together will overcome this situation within EU, but also uh, our neighboring countries and regions together. You mentioned something very important about the solidarity. Uh, that is my question to you. Um, I think there is something we, we don't see, or maybe you are too busy with the current situation, but what is coming is the fact that the economic crisis will bring with it a lot of poverty and especially will hit a lot of the poor countries. And um, this power, poverty and hunger may kill way more people than the pandemic itself. The question to you is, do you consider already, I mean, the EU, I know it's not exactly in your portfolio, but you considering already certain steps um, that you could take in order to coordinate efforts, maybe together with the United Nations, to this time to see in time this upcoming disaster and to save life, lives by, um, by acting in advance on this issue. Thank you very much and good luck to you and to your team. Thank you, Vice President Viganin. And I give the floor to Artur Gerasimov from Ukraine. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear ambassador. First of all, I want to say a big thank you from Ukraine to the European Union for a swift allocation of significant support package for Ukraine for, to fight COVID-19 uh, pandemic and counter its social economic consequences, especially in Eastern Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in your speech, uh, the ambassador, you told about respect to fundamental values and principles. And we understand this is not only about the freedoms of people, but at the same time about respect to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the states. 
And that's why at the moment we are really worried. And we spoke in, in our previous conversation about it as well, that we see now that Russia continues to use pandemic as opportunity to lift sanctions. But, but, Crimea is still occupied. Part of this bus is still occupied. And uh, Russia is not only occupation power, but also blocking international medical and humanitarian access to the area, blocking special monitoring mission from visiting all the territory. That's why my question uh, raised from this issue. Uh, are you going to use now some additional tools, additional mechanisms to force Russia as occupying power in Crimea and occupied part of Donbass with purpose to open the data about number of COVID-19 uh, cases and open uh, the territories, Crimea and occupy, uh, occupied part of Donbass for um, human rights and uh, medical organization with purpose to monitor the situation and to open occupied territory for the humanitarian and international medical help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garasimov. Our next speaker is the special representative on fighting corruption, Irene Karalambidis from Cyprus. Irene, you're the floor. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner, for being here with us uh, today and for your interesting uh, insight. Now, uh, my question is, uh, how do you respond to accusations, especially from the southern countries, that EU, the most well-founded institutional alliance between advanced states, has failed to deliver either in vision or in mission, has failed to provide solidarity. And um, also, um, the European Union was supposed to aim to develop the most dynamic economy, and that was uh, the Lisbon strategy all about, about innovation, about, about science, nothing has been done and a simple uh, biological agent has triggered all this mess. How do you respond to that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Karalambitis. The next is Doris Barnacher of the Second Committee. Doris, you have the floor. Well, thank you. And hello, uh, Mr. Yanid Lenadzic. It's a pleasure to see you again. My question is, um, does the EU take any efforts against food shortages that will come up? Because we already heard that farm laborers can't cross borders and uh, um, countries are short of. And if the crop can't be brought in, then we have sh uh, food shortages. And I guess my American colleagues should see that problem too coming up. And a question to you and, of course, also to the others, especially my American colleagues. Uh, Mr. Um, our, our first um, speaker, Mr. Rama, said something to the concern of the service of common goods. Common goods to me will be eventually the uh, medicine, the medication against this virus. Ca how can we make sure that everybody gets it? And uh, that the, uh, that we don't quarrel about price and um, um, patents and things like that. We need to have them available for everyone to a decent price. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnett. Next speaker is uh, Vice President Gazai Gulia. Gazai, the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Uh, it is really nice to see uh, Mr. Lenachis again. Uh, my question is about the Eastern Partnership Program. Uh, President Sertil has uh, that up and already parted this issue, this question, but uh, I'd like to ask you, what is the EU position with regards to the Eastern Partnership Program countries? As you know, that there are six countries who are the members of OECE. And uh, the last, uh, let's say, uh, news coming from some of the European uh, politicians is a bit worrying about that. Uh, they said that uh, European Union should concentrate on its own problems in the time of the, the, the crisis. There is no need to uh, have a, just a previous uh, program for the Eastern partnership countries. Do you think that is it uh, about the collapse of strategy for the Eastern partnership program countries or do you have really the, some precise uh, let's say position or the strategy for uh, boosting on uh, this program, this partnership countries program again. 
So in that regard, uh, would you please uh, comment on your portfolio, what do you have uh, in your portfolio to assist the same way that you do for the EU member countries uh, when it comes to the Eastern Partnership Program, uh, Eastern Partnership countries. This is a very momentum for us to know how the, the EU is planning to further continue its uh, cooperation and the strategy to these countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Guliev. Uh, the Commissioner has to leave us in 10 minutes. I have two more speakers, Ilka Kanerva and Margareta Sederfeld. If you can make your questions very short as the last two speakers did, so that we can give a good answer, good chance for the Commissioner to answer. Ilka Kanerva, President. Absolutely, very, very briefly. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, pandemic stipulates, uh, in a way, some new challenges and, and probably uh, some new tasks as well. Uh, for the crisis management, uh, which, with, with the consequences which will increase the presence of the, of the uh, international community. So it is politically very important. And, and my question is that, uh, have, you, have you noticed, have you recognized any specific political interest or disinformation in, in the crisis management operations in, in, in various parts of the, of the, of the uh, EU interests. Thank you. Thank you, President Canerva. Margareta Sederfeld, the last question, and then uh, I'll back to Commissioner Reinhardt. Margareta Sederfeld? Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Ambassadors, for your presentation. The question is about post-corona. Now, there is, uh, I mean, we have uh, the, the tension goes on, but that we have a day after. My answer still that today, with a lack of uh, whatever, everything, <laughs> and uh, I do also see a risk for mistrust, mistrust against authorities, mistrust against within people uh, and also try to blame. It's always somebody else's fault. And this might be just as dangerous as the uh, pandemic we have right now. And how do this discussion goes on in, uh, uh, in the EU right now? I know we have it here in the Swedish parliament. We have a quite lot of discussions on this, both in the parliament, but as well as with uh, our government what to do post-corona, corona, because it's just as important as uh, the crimes we have today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President Margareta Sederfeld. And now I give back the floor to Ambassador Janis Lenarcic. Thank you very much also for your patience. You've been one hour and a half with us. I know you know very well the OAC Parliamentary Assembly. You're used to our modus operandi. But thanks for your patience and we look forward to you here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes, very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you for all these uh, comments and questions. I'll try. I'll do my best to to answer them. First of all, I would like to say that um, I uh, inherited a very good legacy from my predecessor, uh, Christos Stylianidis, uh, who also used to be before that a visible and active member of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly. Actually. It's the OSC Parliamentary Assembly where we first met. So it was a pleasure to, to, to take over from him also in this respect. Now, you, President uh, Tseretelli, you asked um, about um, how could EU do more as a major donor and uh, all that. Uh, it won't be easy. Yes, the European Union is the biggest donor of uh, humanitarian and development assistance. But at the same time, the European Union is also very hardly hit by this, by this uh, pandemic. It's, uh, some of its member states are among the hardest hit countries in the world. So one has to take that into account. So our uh, ability is not the same as it, if, as it uh, would have been if uh, uh, Europe itself were not so uh, hard hit. Uh, but uh, we are aware of the fact that uh, even in, in such circumstances, it is imperative, imperative to increase 
European Union support to other countries. And we try to do that. First, on Eastern Partnership, which you asked, but you also, also Mr. Guliev, uh, we have uh, reoriented a large sum of funding for the Eastern Partnership countries in order to help them tackle the, the, the pandemic. A large amount of funding. It goes into three digit figure in euro, in millions of euro. And uh, I can assure you that in spite of some isolated voices in the uh, uh, European Union politics, especially in, in the extreme uh, end, one extreme end of it, that we should now focus on ourselves and help ourselves, I disagree and we disagree because we uh, are keenly aware of the fact that we have to face this challenge globally. We have to help those others who are uh, more uh, vulnerable, who, are, who have weaker health systems, because if we don't help them, if we only help ourselves, we are not going to get far because this virus, if it remains circulating in one part of the world, nobody anywhere else in the world will be safe from it. So we need to, we need to, do, to, 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 to work globally. And that's why we, we are trying to maximize uh, all the available resources also on the, on the uh, external front. I'm very pleased that uh, Senator Cardin emphasized the, the aspect of um, uh, human rights and uh, democratic commitments. I do agree that uh, parliamentarians have a critical role to play parliaments Parliaments are the ones that should be the guardians, the guardians of democracy and uh, the uh, rule of law in all our countries. And these um, values are under stress and pressure at the time. That's why it is even more important that, uh, especially in a crisis like this one, the parliaments watch and make sure that this, that when we get out of the crisis, we get with our values intact and fully preserved. Vice President Beginning, um, I hear a lot of um, complaints and criticism that the uh, European Union was not fast enough uh, and uh, did not see this disaster coming. Uh, of course, it would be uh, false to claim that everything went fine. No. But I do insist that when we talk about the European Union, we understand that the European Union is European institutions, it's European Union member states, and it's European citizens represented by the European Parliament. And everybody, each one of these has its role to play and has competencies. One should not forget that health, civil protection, border management, and things like that under European Union law fall under national competence, national competence, uh, meaning that uh, it's not the European Commission that, that uh, buys masks and ventilators. No, it's the member states that do that. The European Commission, on the other hand, uh, started its work on the pandemic early, before it was pandemic, before it was pandemic. I uh, said already that in uh, January, we already activated all our crisis mechanisms. We called on member states to work on preparedness. But yes, if now you look back, you can only agree that we were not prepared enough. And the explanation is very simple. This is unprecedented. This crisis has not happened in at least 100 years. Nobody could see it coming. Yes, now there are many voices here and there who say, well, uh, I saw it coming, but that's not true. Nobody saw it coming. When we discussed, after we triggered this crisis mechanism, we discussed with everything, with scientists, with uh, others, with doctors. We have, uh, in Europe, we have this ECDC, European Center for uh, <clears throat> Disease Prevention and Control, uh, which provided excellent scientific advice. And, you know, everybody was talking about uh, experiences with SARS, with MERS, with Ebola, but you know, all these previous experiences were different. 
they were localized, the virus eventually died out, nothing ever happened like what is happening now for at least 100 years. The first thing that one can recall is the global flu pandemic after the First World War. First World War. So we haven't seen anything like this for 100 years at least. So, <clears throat> but on your question, Vice President Beginning, Yes, you are absolutely right. This crisis, this pandemic, and the impact of the lockdowns will be severe. I recall that last week, the head of World Food Program, the main UN agency that takes uh, care of people who need food, so as to prevent starvation and hunger, he said that, that the number of people who need, uh, who, who need food will double because of this crisis. Now it's about 135 million people who rely on others for food. Okay? This number will be doubled just because of the economic impact of this, of, this, of this pandemic. So yes, we are aware of that. We're trying to prepare for it. We're trying to increase our assistance, although our funding is uh, now largely committed because we are in the last year of multi-annual European Union budget. But we are already working on several fronts. As I mentioned, we, alre we already launched a humanitarian air bridge, which helps bring humanitarian assistance to places uh, where there are humanitarian needs. Uh, this is very important because we have received a lot of uh, questions and uh, uh, information from uh, non-governmental organizations and international organizations that they cannot bring humanitarian assistance to places where it is needed. So we are working on that. On the other hand, we are working on the next budget for the European Union and my, um, my uh, commitment is to argue in favor of significant, significant increase of humanitarian aid because the needs will go up because of this pandemic. <clears throat> to Mr. Gerasimo, I would like to say that the uh, uh, European Union has a very clear uh, position on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. This position has not changed, um, and uh, the European Union will insist on it. Uh, as for the for the uh, specific challenges related to a pandemic, yes, they exist. And I already mentioned that in um, Eastern Ukraine, we have increased our assistance and also adjusted it so as to enable uh, citizens of Ukraine on both sides of the, uh, of the, of the uh, conflict line to, to be able to face, to face this challenge. <clears throat> about uh, the uh, comment and question by Mrs. Karalabides. Karla uh, well, you are very right. I remember Lisbon strategy was, uh, was adopted early in this, in this uh, millennium, and it has the ambition for the European Union to become the most dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world by 2010. And do you know what happened by 2010? A major financial and economic crisis. Uh, so we should be careful with strategies because uh, events may turn other way. But I think that, uh, that uh, what is happening now is not just a simple biological agent. As I said earlier, what is happening now is something that has never happened in at least 100 years, if not, if not uh, longer. We are dealing with a virus which is extremely contagious, which spreads so fast and so far that it took all countries of the world by surprise. All countries of the world. And <coughs> we, have, we have now... Uh, uh, we, have, we, we, don't have, we don't have medicines, we don't have vaccines, so we have to resort to what I would call medieval methods of social distancing. Because like in the 14th century, during the Great Plague in Europe, 
we have no medicine, no vaccine. This is serious. This is this is something that 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 has not happened in in a century or more. So, uh, and but I'm confident that the European Union and also the world will realize that in such a crisis we can only succeed if we work together, if we if we uh, cooperate. And here I come to Mrs. Barnett's um, uh, uh, warning, which is very. Pertinent that we need to make sure that once we have medication and then vaccine, we need to make sure that it is uh, accessible to all, not only to the rich. The European Union is committed to working in that direction. Very soon, on 4th of May, the European Union will host uh, uh, internet uh, pledging event for uh, developing diagnostics, medical me medicines and uh, vaccines. Uh, and it, this uh, pledging event has an ambition to raise 8 billion US dollars to be devoted to the development of uh, diagnostics, medication and vaccines. So, um, Mr. Canerva, uh, mentioned this information. This is a very, very uh, important uh, thing here. And uh, yes, we see it and we try to counter it. I will not mention where it comes from because uh, you are uh, aware of that. But I would say the following. When one country helps the other, this is something completely normal. If this is a global challenge that has to be tackled globally, we should all welcome when one country helps the other and vice versa. European Union was the first to help China. China requested through our Union Civil Protection Mechanism assistance in medical equipment in early February. And European Union responded favorably and through this civil protection system of our Union, 56 tons of medical equipment went to China because outbreak was there and not anywhere else at the moment. When it came to Europe, China helped, so it returned the favor. Nothing is more normal than that. This is something that is necessary. What is not necessary is propaganda that sometimes accompanies these movements. So we should distinguish between what is normal and desirable and helping each other is something that is normal and desirable and what is propaganda which is certainly not desirable and should be countered, and we try to do that. Another example is Western Balkans. Hmm. There were some who praised uh, third countries for having provided assistance to them uh, and created an impression that the European Union was not doing anything. The fact is that nobody comes close to what European Union is doing in the sense of assistance in the countries of Western Balkans, for instance. These are just illustrations. And uh, I think that we should we should um, be aware of that, that there is a lot of uh, propaganda out there. We try to counter it and we just would invite everyone to, to rely on facts and not to be misled by the fake news, which brings me to the last uh, comment made by <coughs> Mrs. Sederfeld. Yes, uh, there is a mistrust that is partly also stimulated by fake news. So we should counter with facts. And there is blame game. Blame game is something which is, which is uh, not surprising when you have such a crisis. You know, member states, governments all over the world are under pressure because people are getting sick, people are uh, dying, and uh, there needs to be somebody who's responsible for that. And then you have some people who blame the United Nations and World Health Organization. You have some people who blame EU, you have some people who blame the mobile, uh, mobile uh, uh, network of fifth generation and so on and so on. This is all fake news. This is, all, this is usually nothing but an attempt to deflect attention from one's own shortcomings. You know, that they blame this, uh, last, uh, especially multilateral, uh, multilateral uh, organizations that are, uh, that are uh, very handy as a scapegoat. I would reject that, uh, uh, and if you, if anybody really needs a culprit 
for what is going on, I have a very simple answer. It's, it's the virus. Thank you for your attention. It was great pleasure to see you, to talk to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Narcic, Commissioner Narcic. This was excellent, very comprehensive, and I'm sure all our members really enjoyed it. And thank you very much for all the time you dedicated to us.